You have Patrick Fendaro here, co-founder at Vetted Biz. Today, I'm very excited to have on two executives from Pool Scouts, Michael Wagner, who's the president of Pool Scouts, as well as Natalie Weaver, who's the director of franchise development. In today's podcast and YouTube video, we're going to go through the pool servicing industry that's growing a lot in the United States, especially with this work from home and, and, and a lot of people moving to the Southern states. Uh, we're going to go through difference between doing the franchise route versus you're going on your own path if you'd like to enter this industry. And just talk a little bit about the, the economics for someone that might want to be entering into a Pool Scouts uh, franchise. So Michael and Natalie, really appreciate you joining today. Uh, maybe we could start with Michael, just how you entered into the pool service industry as well as franchising as a whole. Well, thank you, Patrick. Excited to be here. Uh, fortunate to have been uh, part of Buzz Franchise Brands since 2015, and I joined the company uh, to, to start our second brand. Um, prior to that, Buzz Franchise Brands uh, was the franchisor for Mosquito Joe, which was our first brand that started in 2012 and uh, had tremendous success. So Kevin Wilson, who's our CEO and founder, uh, wanted to expand into uh, additional home service brands or service brands. And Kevin and I have been friends. We both have children that are seniors in college and we met at a birthday party long, long time ago when our kids were really young. And I stayed in touch with him and was fortunate to, to come on board uh, to start the second brand. I'd done a lot of um, entrepreneurial type things, uh, mostly setting up subsidiaries uh, of wholly owned subsidiaries for a company called Coastal Training Technologies that I set up offices around the world for that company. While they weren't franchises, it was a similar, you know, same business model doing it across, across the globe. Uh, and then I worked in uh, for a large credit union where we had 62 branches all doing kind of the same consumer banking type things across the, uh, the United States as well. So while it wasn't franchising, it was certainly uh, translatable uh, skills and opportunities there and was super excited to be able to come on board here and to, to begin uh, Pool Scouts, which didn't exist as a brand. So we hit the ground running in January officially, having made a small acquisition to start the business uh, in, in, in Virginia Beach, Norfolk, Chesapeake area with a small acquisition of a, a really a route uh, of customers and we hit the ground running from a franchising perspective signing up our first franchisee in 2016 as well we knew that there was a great opportunity to professionalize a very unprofessional traditionally space in business and so uh, I got to come on board and, and help build the team and build the brand but I've also been supported from day one with the buzz franchise brands team which is super strong and experienced and, uh, and a great group of people ultimately. Uh, so since then, we've been uh, really uh, growing fast, especially over the past couple of years where the pool business, as you alluded to, Patrick, has been exploding across the nation. And uh, lots of our franchisees were very happy to be Pool Scouts franchisees amidst the, the pandemic as our business grew and grew really fast and continues to grow. And I can imagine so you've gone from zero to 53 and about six years? 53, yeah, 53 open, 109 awarded. We're in the process right now of opening 10 franchisees in the first quarter of, of 2022. So really fast growth, uh, you know, afforded by ultimately successful franchisees, which is true with any franchise system, is your early adopters need to show success. And then it becomes, I wouldn't say easier, but more fluid might be a better way to describe it, to bring on an, an additional franchisees and make the ones that you have that much more successful. Well, Natalie, it's a good transition to you as you're a huge part of all this expansion and recruiting new franchisees. How did you get into Pool Scouts and, and franchising as a whole? Yeah, absolutely. So I started my franchise career about 10 years ago, um, actually started on the other end of the spectrum with uh, legal and compliance, um, and then moved into franchise development um, for a, a large company out of Richmond, Virginia. And then did some consulting work uh, through COVID. Was pretty tough on the franchise industry, except for brands like this. So was lucky to find these guys and uh, settle right in. So been here over a year and and really looking to help build the brand. Um, Pool Scouts is a great franchise to show to candidates, um, especially being you know resilient through COVID and and the growth that we have right now. So I imagine people that own a pool, they get it. 
and they're like, okay, I pay a lot of money on this. I, I see the ROI when I have a professional service person. Maybe I tried it for a month cleaning my own pool and it wasn't worth it. So, you know, I get those people get it, I'm sure. And they're easy to talk about pool scouts with. But how about those other people like me that don't own a pool yet that uh, want to know a little bit more about this industry and, and just the potential in it? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. You know, I think I always love to describe our business and our business model as, you know, it's not an uber sexy business at all. People don't aspire to say, yeah, I want to go out and clean and maintain swimming. That's pools, fine. Right. But what people do get uh, very attracted to, and to me, of course, with, which things are components of the business that are sexy are this recurring service, this predictability, knowing who your target customer is and what you focus on are really important components of business that allow you to scale, grow, and ultimately understand the unit economics with the business. Uh, so when you describe those things, people get more excited about the opportunity. And really, at the end of the day, our, our, we're a community-oriented business. Our most successful franchisees will service over 1,000 customers this year. That's a lot of customer relationships in a community. And the business owner, the franchisee, is very prominently visible in those communities where they're servicing that, that kind of quantity of customers. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a present in the community type business as well, involving people, not only customers, but ultimately employees and technicians that are out there doing the work. So those are some of the things that we talk about, predictability, scalability of the business, and just the simplicity of the business model as well. Uh, people like those things a lot. Home service businesses offer those opportunities. And the pool business amidst the home services businesses has been a very attractive one. Well, also what's appealing to me is just like from a prospecting standpoint, you know which homes have pools. You can use different data, even Google Maps. And it's really evident who your prospective buyers are of your service. So it falls on, I imagine you, the franchisor, working with the franchisee to, to go after those leads. Well, it even starts ahead of that. When Natalie is talking with candidates, we provide the territory maps. Patrick, in our case, the territories are zip code protected and, and owned by the franchisee. And ultimately, those uh, territories consist of eight to 12,000 single family homes with in-ground pools with incomes above a certain threshold. And so they get to see those maps before they ever sign up as a franchisee. So they know what they're doing. And then once they become franchisees, we do a lot as a franchise system to help them get the phone to ring to acquire customers for those specific target households. So it's a very focused effort that starts from the franchise mapping process very early on when Natalie's talking to, to candidates. So Natalie, I don't know if you want to add some. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, you can see a big difference in interest when someone's betting out several different franchise brands and, and they ask that territory question, you know, they're, oh, I'm looking at another brand and they're giving me eight zip codes. And I'm like, eight zip codes of what? Like we already, <laughs> we have the, we have the data to back it up. And I, I go into exactly what Michael just said, you know, we're looking at this many homes with this much, much income with this many pools. So I think it makes a difference to know that they're like, wow, there's that information's already taken care of for me. I don't have to go out there and find it. So I think that makes a big difference um, to the, the candidate to know that we, we've got that kind of backing and research. And it's not vague. Yeah. Like you could say there's 100,000 households, but that doesn't mean that that addressable market's 100,000 for whatever product you're selling. Right. Uh, but that's a big appeal. So say like 10,000 pools to go after in a given zip code, like what success, Natalie and Michael, to a, a franchisee? Is it getting... 200 pools, 500 pools, like what do you, what's like a successful franchisee and people measure success differently and you have lifestyle entrepreneurs and those that want to be making 200, 300K a year, but what, it, what do Pool Scout franchisees aspire to? So there's lots of metrics we use to demonstrate success in the early stages of the franchise, Patrick, we talk about, you know, how many recurring customers that our franchisees acquire and retain because that's where this predictability in the business model is ultimately. 
Um, and we do a lot to through direct mail, digital marketing, and supporting them on community initiatives as well to help them recruit those customers. And we help measure all of the number of incoming calls, the number of clicks, the number of leads, et cetera, the conversion rates, all those things that allow them to kind of see success from a from a customer perspective. And then we have lots of metrics around our business. Last year, our average value per customer was $1,095. And that was simply put total number of revenue versus uh, divided by total number of customers serviced across the country. And of that, you know, we had over 60% of the customers that were invoiced for the first time in 2021 as well. So lots of customer growth, but still growth in the share of the wallet ultimately. And so each franchisee has lots of metrics that they can see that allow them to benchmark against other franchises, as well as you know what their budget and their plans are. As far as market penetration, that really varies by franchisee and market. Uh, ultimately, we do show some of that data in our item 19 representation in our franchise disclosure document about market penetration in our particular corporate owned uh, territories that we, uh, that we operate. Um, but that really varies. But each each franchisee has certain metrics that they're looking at. And in the beginning, I always love to tell this to, to prospective franchisees is year one is all about customer acquisition and building up that base of customers that then they're going to continue to build on, build on. You know, ultimately in home service businesses, we get paid not to drive, but to do. And so tighter concentration of, of customers in a small area is what we're trying to drive ultimately. And our marketing that we do helps uh, help drives a, a, those initiatives as well. I imagine <laughs> word of mouth can really come in handy. I mean, if you service one home well, and then you you don't have to be driving all over the place, and you can get a whole community. That's really about branding too. You know, our big bright colors that we've got on this side here, and and our vans are the kind of rolling billboards for for our brand. Referrals were the third best source of customer acquisition we had in 2021, despite the fact we had so many new franchisees that were launching and, and beginning their business. Uh, it, was, it was a great source of customers for us. But when you have a brand and you have a strong presence in the community, those referrals are great customer opportunities. And obviously, the more mature franchisees get a lot more referrals than the ones that are brand new and just launching on their business. Um, so we've really had a, a lot of growth there and we continue in 2022 to expect that to be a top source for us across the system from a franchise, uh, you know, from a customer acquisition perspective. How do the markets vary? You know, I know you have a strong presence in, in parts of New York, like Long Island, where you might have people that use the pool four or five months a year, and then you have Natalie down in Sarasota, Florida, it's year round. How does how does that really vary and how do franchisees manage the seasonality of the business in states like um, New York or even Northern Virginia and the Mid-Atlantic compared mm -hmm. to the year-round markets like Florida and Southern California? Yeah, so uh, I, I would say first off, our best-selling product Patrick, across our franchise system is weekly pool service. That said, in seasonal markets, we're now in 17 different states we're as far uh, north, uh, depending on how you measure it. We're in Columbus, Ohio. We're in Boise, Idaho okay. uh, as well. Uh, we're in Salt Lake City, Utah, getting ready to open up there. Uh, we're in Northern Virginia, as you mentioned. Uh, so we have a, really a representation. We have uh, a new franchisee in Michigan that'll be opening shortly as well, uh, and Connecticut as well. So those will be seasonal markets. Patrick, in those markets, we have what I call the bookends of the business, and those are openings of pools and closings of pools at the end of the season. Inevitably, the season's a lot longer than everybody expects to, it to be when they come into this business. Pools open a lot earlier and close a lot later than people. Are there just more heated pools or what is that? It's, it's inevitable that, that they're either heated or you have people just waiting and, you know, wanting to, to potentially use it or look yeah, at hoping it. Hoping that whatever. there's going to be that warm, like November day in Connecticut. Got it. Got it. Exactly. So the seasons are a lot longer than people expect them to be. But those bookends of business are spectacular revenue generating opportunities. The average value to close a pool or open pool was north of $300. 
Uh, and so even just opening them, closing a pool, we could be between six and $750 per customer. We just did those two services. And many of our franchisees have customers that pay them just for those services. And then obviously many pay for the regular recurring service on top of that. Um, but those customer acquisition opportunities and revenue generation around the seasonal markets afford those franchisees you know, solid revenue per customer numbers, solid customer acquisition numbers. And, you know, those pools that we closed in September, October, November, December, believe it or not, uh, those pools will be opened mostly, um, you know, that they'll start opening in March and March, hmm. April, May, et cetera. So there's still predictability, even if it's just doing the openings and closings, most of the pools that we close, we're going to open most of the pools we open, we're going to close, et cetera. So there's really a great opportunity from a seasonal perspective. And then the year round markets, we're in their backyard, mostly 52 weeks a year. And those are markets like Florida, different parts of Florida, of course, we're all over Florida and in Texas as well. Um, there's been some anomaly events last year. There was the, the great freeze that happened in Dallas. Uh, where there was, you know, traditionally 52 week year markets, the pools froze and those uh, pools needed to be not only uh, maintained and cleaned, but repaired in a lot of cases. Yeah, I can so imagine. That was unique too, but uh, we really have a, a good model in either seasonal or in year round markets too. Natalie, do you talk to prospective candidates that are like debating buying an existing pool route, starting from scratch, and then also looking at going the franchise route with pool scouts? Yeah, absolutely. I have a couple of candidates like that right now um, and, and, you know, vetting different opportunities. I want, I, I want to say one thing that I think sets us apart is the leadership team. Um, so, you know, having Michael and, and Kevin and, and Brian Garrison, all of those guys with the experience that they've had in the franchise industry, um, you know, speaks volumes. Uh, they know what they're doing. They're very supportive. I'll say from experience, I've, I've worked through a lot of franchise brands and I've never seen the dedication that I do here to our franchisees. Um, we want them to be successful. We want to support them and have those tools and technology in their hands to be able to do so. Um, this is a very fragmented industry. Um, prime example, you know, I, I was talking to a guy the other day that's local here um, and he's on his 13th pool guy, as, you know, as they call him in three years. Um, they don't show up, they don't, you know, they, they find another job. I think with having an established franchise brand and the backing of Buzz, these, these guys that are um, coming on have the best equipment, they have the best vehicles, they have support, they know, you know, hey, this guy, we might get our birthdays off. So we try to offer, you know, those kind of advantages where the mom and pops are going to get kind of blown out of the water in an area like that. And I imagine like you have a strong community where they can tap into the 50 plus franchisees. Like if they're having HR issues, like, Hey, you know, I've had two guys quit. Like what's the best way to, to retain talent and also recruit talent where. Yeah. I mean, we have a new franchisee coming on that's actually working for a, a neighboring franchisee before he launches. So it just kind of shows that community and, and partnership that we have within the brand as well. Yeah. But you bring up people and that's always a challenge, especially when you look at a service industry, Patrick, where, you know, I think that's, Whenever anybody asks me what's the most difficult part of the business, and, I, and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm 51 and I've had a couple different places where I've worked, and I would say it's always the most difficult part of any business is the people, right? And so in our case, it's no different. Recruiting and retaining talent uh, in, in this business is certainly a challenge. We provide some great tools to our franchisees that allow them to more easily recruit people. Uh, we have a corporate relationship with Indeed. We provide standardized job descriptions. We use a tool called Career Plug to allow them to do background checks and bring in all the candidates and respond accordingly. Um, and then there's just the branding of, of what goes on. It was interesting. I was last night watching a basketball game and there was a, a Domino's commercial on and it was talking about someone who was a an employee that became a franchisee and really how proud they it's were the domino's together. model yeah they, yeah. So i think they really only recruit internally it's it's great you know in a sense that you build this this community of folks that have worked or work with your organization you know and, and certainly the, the old adage of if you don't train people well then you know what are you expecting them to do i mean i think we have started to really build a community of professionals in this industry um, and that that want to help each other out and help build the brand overall. 
we have six franchisees in Dallas right now. They work really collaboratively well because they know that they're raising, you know, the, the performance of everybody when they do so. And that's starting to happen around the regions that we service and around the country, which is really exciting. But we do a lot to help the franchisees. Back to your comment about like, go at it alone or start from zero or buy a pool route or whatever there might be. Those are, those are certainly opportunities but you've got a lot of discovery to happen to be able to do it well, where we provide the systems, the structure, the branding, the marketing, you know, and, and the training, the vendor relationships, all of which is true to anything in franchising. But there's a lot of opportunities to, to kind of fall on your face if you're going to go at it alone. As far so you as can buying, de-risk um, the business success, like if you go out like in South Florida and want to buy an existing pool route, that owner could start a, another business in an adjacent category forget what the contract says do you want to be litigating against him uh for a couple of years and like you don't know what's going on or like i mean south i guess south florida is just kind of more of a mess probably than other parts of the country but like if you're buying an existing business uh, a lot of cash payments they're not running the business up to par that is kind of what it should be as a professional standard like uh pool scouts yeah, but we have worked with franchisees who've wanted to jumpstart their business and, and acquire a route or have converted a business to be a franchise. We had one in Dallas that did that. And so we've worked with, with those kinds of folks as well, where we afford them a, a royalty holiday on customers that, that get converted or brought in uh, upon the franchise itself. Uh, so it's, you know, that, that is a way, it's a very expensive way to acquire customers. Ultimately, what, what's the multiple, like, do you know what so really the pool routes themselves trade for anywhere from uh, 70 cents to 110 cents, <laughs> such a such thing, um, you know, per, per, but it's really just based on the recurring service model, not any of the repair work or any of the outside work that's done there. Uh, but it is an expensive uh, customer acquisition. And then, you know, having done this with some franchisees, the key is not to take a, a route of 50 pools and buy it. And, you know, a year and a half or two years later, only have 30 pools. The key is to buy that route. if You're going to do it and take that 50 really pools expensive. and turn it into 100 pools because of the referrals and the opportunities for Rust, uh, customer concentration and those kinds of things. So I think, you know, those are, those are opportunities, but what we do from a marketing perspective really helps to get the phone to ring for the franchisees, both uh, direct mail, digital marketing, and then the community oriented stuff that we support them with. It works and we track it and we provide all the data points so that the franchisees know, let's do more of that. Let's uh, let's do less of that. Let's uh, make sure we answer the phone. Let's not, <laughs> you know, those kinds of things. Just gotta show up. I mean, a lot of a up. lot of it's just showing up, answering yeah. the phone. And I mean, they're they're gonna they need someone to clean their pool. It's gonna be pool scouts or it's gonna be someone else. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Our opportunities and what we've seen, our ability to differentiate our service is very material uh you know we do things like bring systems we we text our customers let them know we're there we have post-service reports for uh email uh, that we send by email with before and after pictures and all the chemistry readings and who was there we use a net promoter score system to rate you know customer uh satisfaction across and be able to track and uh, monitor performance at the technician level at the franchisee level Etc. You know, background checks on all of their employees that are hired throughout the system to know who's in your backyard. Um, you know, there's a lot of great things that we offer that you would think be would be normal that that aren't certainly in the in the mom and pop side of things. So our opportunity to differentiate compared to to our competitors is is pretty material. And uh, you know, our customer acquisition numbers and our growth numbers. We grew at 75% uh, last year, system-wide revenue compared to year prior. Um, this year, we're starting off like gangbusters, both from a franchise development standpoint and from a organic growth standpoint as well. So feeling very bullish about our future here. That's exciting. And, and we discussed the inorganic way and you can acquire 50, 100 routes and really kickstart it, but that's gonna be expensive and, and priced out for a lot of people. How much does it cost to, to start um, a Pool Scouts franchise? Like, what are they looking to to invest in? 
Yeah, so our, our single territory fee is is only twenty five thousand dollars, and that it, you know as I mentioned is eight to twelve thousand target households mapped and protected by zip code. We say to get started in a single territory, you're looking you know and and the representation which is in the franchise disclosure document uh, at about one hundred twenty hundred twenty five thousand dollars to get the business started. Okay. Which is year one marketing spend, three months worth of cash flow, upfront costs for uh, vehicle leases and equipment and those kinds of things. So it's a true representation of kind of, uh, you know, what, what the costs are to get started in the business. Um, for multiple territories, we have an area developer agreement where franchisees expand into a second territory after 12 months in their first territory. So they really focus on going deep rather than wide across the, uh, the customer base there. And how do you help franchisees open fast because that capital's sitting there and it's not working and we're in an environment inflation six seven percent Miami Beach where I live it's probably like 15 20 percent but how do you get people to start putting that capital to work where yeah. they open up the business fast break even fast and then they hit that income replacement so if they left their corporate job like they they're making that money back hopefully more. How do you yeah. really try to get the franchisee to hit those three milestones as fast as possible? So it's really about following the model, Patrick. First off, on the onboarding and training process, our goal is to get people onboarded and up and running within 90 days. Now, I say that, but I want to make sure in seasonal markets, there is a timing to opening the business. So we're not going to open a business in Columbus, Ohio in December. We're going to be launching that business really to open. It'd be kind of depressing. <laughs> you wouldn't do a great job. Grand of opening parks. party and no one shows up. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we would, but, but, but our goal is to get people up and running within, you know, 90 days. And that's a, that's a collaborative process with the franchisee, but we have very much of a model in place this year alone. We have 12 training classes that we'll be doing. Uh, we've already executed one. We're in the process next week of our second training class. Most of the time, uh, the training is done here in our offices in Virginia Beach. Our field training, however, last uh, in our first first training class was done in, in uh, Fort Myers, Florida, because we it's cold here and it actually yeah. snowed here. Uh, so we we are afforded some flexibility as far as where we do the field training, and then we have business training, which is done mostly virtually. So that onboarding process is a very intense process of making sure the franchisees get stepped through each box that they've got to check. And that includes things like their legal documentation, their banking, their systems set up, their insurance, all the things that are part of any franchise or any business set up. And then there's the training and onboarding process that, that we really work hands-on with the franchisee to get them up running. As far as their performance, year one's all about acquisition of customers and building that base. And we'll tell franchisees, you're not gonna make money in year one. It's about establishing that base investing in the marketing. One of the things that we do that's unique, Patrick, is we collect in year one, uh, their first year's marketing spend, both direct mail and we have digital marketing requirements there in search engine optimization so that everyone realizes it's an investment they're putting into the startup of their business. Many franchise systems will say, go spend this in marketing. We actually don't just say, we actually help them execute. Do it. Because if marketing. you don't, the business isn't going to get off the ground. 100%. Businesses fail generally because they run out of cash. Exactly. So we make sure that our candidates that Natalie brings in, you know, are vetted and qualified from a financial perspective that they realize the investment that they're making and the timelines associated with that. We help them build a pro forma from, you know, once we, we bring them into the system that helps them understand what their goals and metrics are associated with that. Uh, so we've got a thing too to say is, you know, that's kind of a promise that we make when I have someone in the, in the pipeline is, you know, they're going through this process and getting vetted and making sure they're financially stable, that that's a promise that we're going to do that after them as well, because we don't want to put someone next to them in a territory, you know, 30 miles, 40 miles, hundred miles down the road. That's also not qualified. So I think it makes a big difference to them too, to know that we're growing the brand, but we're growing the brand for the right reasons with the right people. Well, there's so much shared learning, like from the franchisees themselves and the data that they provide, the qualitative, quantitative data they provide to you, Natalie and Michael and your team, where if you have some people that are kind of bringing the system down and, and aren't fully on board, whether that's through capitalization or experience or drive, I mean, that's going to hurt everyone. 100%, you know, 
franchise systems grow ultimately through successful franchisees and what we call validation. And we're very transparent as a brand throughout the, the franchise development or discovery process, as we call it, on validation. We hand the list of all of our franchisees out to candidates and they can call and talk to anybody. So, you know, that's a very serious thing. And the way we describe it in, in, in my world from a franchise perspective, and when we're bringing on team members to join our team, we say, you know, if you really step back and you think about it, candidates are in many cases quitting their job they're taking a portion of their life savings that they worked really hard for or borrowing money against that. And they're putting it in a bag and they're pushing it across the table to us to help them build long-term wealth, flexibility and balance in life and, and really you know, that independence of business ownership. And so that's a very serious responsibility, but it's also a very personal relationship. Our franchise disclosure document, our relationship is a 10 year relationship. And so it is, and I always say it's, you know, in some businesses, especially in a corporate world, you got your business and your personal, and those are very separate. But in the case of a franchise or a franchisee relationship, in many cases, it's a personal relationship that we take very seriously. Uh, and, you know, we're here to support them. But we also want to make sure we're bringing the right people into the family. It's like a marriage. You want to be super excited that you're getting married both sides and that, uh, that you're stoked to be uh, in that relationship. So that's really, Natalie comes into play heavily on that, on bringing the right candidates to the table. And I'm sure, you know, as you continue to grow, the acquisition costs for, for Natalie's side of the business, getting new franchisees is just going to keep going down. And that side's probably going to be more and more referrals or people just opening up adjacent territories. It, it is makes definitely... It yeah, last year we had uh, we had referrals that brought in two new franchisees, um, and so that definitely, as your brand grows and as your success of your franchisees grows, uh, grows, so do you know the opportunities, like you say, for referrals. Just like customers on the franchisee side, it's a lot easier to get a referral when you have you know five hundred customers who are proponents of your brand, and the same thing's true from a franchising perspective. Uh, so Cost of time and money. Exactly. You don't have to educate someone and someone else sells the the product or service or sells the business opportunity for you. I mean, that's going to save everyone a lot of time. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We had one referral already in 2022 for a new franchisee coming on board. So we're super excited about that. We, uh, we, we make it worth the while for franchisees that refer us to, we give them a, nice. a referral bonus, but Ultimately, just like on the customer side, when you get a referral, more often than not, the customer they're referring you to looks exactly like the one that you just had, which is generally a good one because they wouldn't, you know, wouldn't refer you otherwise. So, yeah, that's that's really when validation comes to a, a full head and is super exciting. And then you hit that, like I said, a tipping point from a, a brand perspective. Where are you guys eager to expand? Yeah, we just redefined uh, kind of our target markets geographically. Uh, we have a lot of markets that we want to move into. Uh, you brought up, we're not right now in Long Island, but we certainly want to be in Long Island. So New York is a, is a market for us, definitely, that we'd like to get into. Um, we are in good parts of Texas. They're all good parts, first of all, but we're not yet in San Antonio. That's a target market for us that we'd like to get into. Um, as far as the Carolinas, mostly sold out in uh, North Carolina, albeit the, the triad areas, they call it Greensboro, High Point, Winston-Salem is a target area for us, um, you know, as well as Fayetteville. And then uh, South Carolina, we, we really wanna be in uh, Columbia and in the Greenville-Spartanburg area. Those are certainly target markets for us. Oklahoma City is another great market for us. We are super fired up to be in Kansas City, uh, both Kansas and Missouri. So some of those Midwestern states where the metropolitan areas are, are great opportunities for us uh, as well. Um, so there, there are lots of, of great markets. We're just now in Maryland, but in Annapolis, the other markets within Maryland. Um, we're opening up in Richmond right now, uh, coming up soon. There's another territory opportunity there that we're fired up about. Natalie, Vegas. we need Vegas, Vegas. Thank you. I don't know how I didn't remember that one. That's uh, an awesome market. Yeah, it is a great market. One we've been targeting for, for a while that we'll, uh, we'll get in. But what we find Patrick is 
we start talking about the target markets. We do some digital ad uh, you know, marketing in those age, you know, in those markets. Our franchise development people know how excited we get about those markets. And we also work with some of the consulting networks to try and target specific areas as well. Um, so lots of great areas, you know, with 109 territories, really, when I look forward for our brand, we, we have 350 to 400 uh, territories available in the United States that are solid, viable territories. So we've got a lot of room to grow, uh, in addition to obviously continuing to open up the additional territories that our existing franchisees have, which we'll do robustly over the next couple of years too. And how has COVID affected your business? I imagine, you know, there's been a net positive as people are spending more time at home as we, we, we discussed, but I'm curious, just like the day-to-day -day business operations, has it, has it changed much? Yeah. So from a positive perspective, the swimming pool industry, residential swimming pools in particular, which is what we focus on in 2020, uh, grew at 24% over 2019, 2021 numbers were similar. That's unprecedented. It's nice. Normally growth is, you know, four to 6% across the country <laughs> is normal. Uh, so the, the pool business, people are spending more time and money on their homes than they ever have before. And the pool business has been very much of a boom business. A lot of people, and there's a lot of PE money behind it that's following those kinds of things. Um, our services were deemed uh, essential from day one. So we never had to, we had to, you know, make sure we were protecting our technicians and our customers, of course, across the board, we operated a little bit differently by doing some things. But from day one, people were going to be spending more time at their own pools than ever, which meant they needed to be clean more than ever. We were essential service. So we really saw great positive growth on that standpoint from a customer standpoint uh, as well. And then from a challenging standpoint, we are not, unfortunately, um, we can't, you know, we can't avoid the, the labor shortage that's out there in America and the inflationary pressures associated with that. So we are raising our prices to, for services we offer across the country. And then the last thing, which was really challenging for us in 2021 was um, supplies and not only were they you know, affected by the normal challenges of transportation and people that everybody has uh, going on in any kind of industry, there was a chlorine fire in a, in a plant, a biolab plant in Louisiana that really made there not be the, the amount of chlorine that, that needed was needed across the country. Uh, so we had to really pivot and try and find alternative sources and products that we've uh, been successful doing. Um, so those are some of the challenges that we've affected. At the end of the day, it, things are getting better, but the pricing of our services and products is continuing to go up and will continue to go up. Last year, we had three price adjustments from a chemicals and product standpoint. I suspect we'll have at least that this year. We've already had our first. Are there some cost savings for franchisees? Like, do they, how does that yeah. work? Do you buy in yeah. bulk and then pass the discount on to franchisees? Uh, we, we, we don't buy in bulk, but we negotiate um, corporate pricing on behalf of two major suppliers across the country. Um, and so they, they're afforded corporate pricing for pool scouts from day one, along with credit facility. Um, so, and, and that's not unique to franchising nor our brand, but they get a much better deal than they would get on their own by being part of the pool scouts family. And they get great support from our partner vendors that we work with. To conclude today's conversation, like at Vetted Biz, we're all about data, whether it's analyzing franchises, like franchise failure, growth, investment amounts. For a franchisee, what KPIs, what data should they be tracking daily, if not weekly? Yeah, so to, to begin with, it's, it's all about customer acquisition. And so it's following the marketing plan and model and then understanding the response rates and the conversion rates, et cetera. But it's about building that base. And then I always say with any home service business, Patrick, it's about generating gross margin. So in our case, that's acquiring the customers, generating the revenue, and then and retaining the customers, of course, and then closely measuring and monitoring labor and cost of goods sold. Those are the key things. Everything beyond the gross profit number, those numbers below the line, as I call it, they're very predictable. And we know what they're going to be. So it's really about focusing up top above the line, which is 
you know, customer acquisition, customer retention, revenue generation, and then closely monitoring the labor costs and the cost of goods sold. Uh, and in most cases, our franchisees are charging for chemicals. Those margins are already built in. So it's just a monitoring of, of inventory and, you know, making sure that things aren't getting wasted in that case. So that's, uh, those are the key metrics. Once a business is more established, it's about generating the, that gross profit and gross margin that I mentioned, and then effectively managing, you know, costs overall. But it's pretty predictable and scalable, uh, you know, as we've seen our franchisees mature, which is one of the things that makes it a very attractive business model is that predictability around the model itself. And it's going to be an asset. So it's a good cash flow business, but as as it's expensive to buy an existing pool route one day when people yeah. decide to move or retire that should be a nice asset that they can sell for a good amount yeah any business particularly a franchise business is you know it's not in the name of of, of michael's pool service for instance and there's value of someone else plugging and playing into that business much more so than, uh, than, than Michael's pool service, for instance. But you know, businesses that trade for a good multiple are ones that are not only generating great profits and good margins, but that are growing, right? And uh, that's some of the things that are super exciting for me is looking at our most mature franchisee in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, who opened in late 2016, yet last year grew her business at north of 60% and is so far tracking year to date at 109% of, uh, of growth compared to last year. So seeing these established businesses continue to grow really increases ultimately the multiple on, on when in fact people wanna exit out of, uh, out of the business. Uh, and it's contagious. And was, if your other franchisees are growing, it's like, what's he doing? Like, I wanna be doing that. 100% true, 100% true. So yeah, those are some of the things that that uh, get me super excited, and as I said, very bullish uh, on our future. And uh, you know, I think um, Natalie and our other franchise development executives, you know, they're 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 getting momentum even more so. And when we had our best franchise development year last year, we we see that momentum carrying forward into to 2022 and beyond, where you know things are the pipelines are good, the candidates are getting better and better. And there is some word of mouth type things that are going on too. That's exciting. Any concluding thoughts? We'll, we'll definitely be sh sure to give the, the contact information, Natalie, in the, in the call notes for anyone that's interested in potentially um, looking further at a Pool Scouts franchise. But beyond the, the contact information, anything else you'd like to get out to those listeners? Yeah, I don't think so. Thanks for, for giving us the opportunity. I'd say, um, like Michael said, I'll echo it. Uh, our pipeline's probably the best it's ever been. So uh, don't don't stick around. I'd, I'd jump on it if I were you, because a lot of stuff. Vegas. Going <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Vegas. Let's do Vegas. Um, a lot of a lot of prime markets are going quick, and we're getting a lot of traction. So it's good. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. Appreciate the the opportunity to talk to you and to your listeners as well. You know, I always say that, you know, home service businesses, while people don't necessarily see themselves doing these things, the, the components that I mentioned make them very attractive opportunities with lower costs of investment in many cases, and that predictability and scalability, which make them, which make them sexy, honestly. Uh, so I think, you know, consider those things as you're, as you're looking out there. And, you know, business ownership is not for everybody. Uh, franchising gives people a, a, a model to follow, a community of folks to be a part of, you know, a bigger brand and lots of support. Everybody here at Buzz Franchise Brands, we all exist to what we, what we say our mission is to enable people to realize their dreams of business ownership. So we all work for the franchisees and do so, uh, you know, in, in a very passionate way. And uh, it's a lot of fun too. Uh, building a business is hard work, but it should be a lot of fun. And uh, I hope people get the bug and want to uh, develop and continue to, to do that as we've seen them do lately. That's well said. And it really resonated to me that the 90 days to start because someone opening up a, a restaurant here in, in Miami-Dade, Florida, it's going to be at least 12 months. So that capital is just sitting there, permits, a fitness studio, pretty similar, maybe a little less time. So to the extent that they can really hit the ground running in 90 days, I mean, that's incredible where they can start really building that customer base. So appreciate both of you joining today. It was an absolute pleasure. And as I mentioned, for those interested in exploring a Pool Scouts franchise, 
be sure to, to click the link and you can contact Natalie. Thank you, Patrick.